questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in your thread you talk about several different areas, let's say. You talk about aesthetics, politics, morality, principles and passions, and you present these as examples of things that evolutionary psychology, as you say, cannot properly tackle or explain at least only through the tools that evolutionary psychology has at its disposal, let's say. So, uh, but, uh, but let's just pick up on one of those examples. And since we, uh, we were talking about beauty and the fingernails and those things, those things. Let, let's talk a little bit about aesthetics, because at a certain point in your thread, as far as I remember, you talk about how uh, evolutionary psychology, uh, with the tools that it has, couldn't really explain why people would develop a taste for uh, ugly stuff or grotesque stuff. Yeah. So could you please tell us a, li a little bit about that and then perhaps we will discuss it for me just to try to convince you that perhaps there's a bit more to the evolutionary psychological method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess I, I should clarify, and it's, it's possible obviously on, on, on Twitter or anytime, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, you're prone to, to misstate or overstate. So, so I shouldn't say evolutionary psychology has, has no insight on these domains. I kind of meant it more of a relative statement, which is that that in these domains, there's a lot of open uh, material that that I, I, I'm more prone to seeing evolutionary psych like either um, skirting or giving the wrong explanation for it. But but I don't mean to say that that um, uh, that. that Evolutionary psych tools haven't offered any insight on these topics. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, I mostly mean it as like, you know, in the broad scope of things, compared to like how well we understand mating or, 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 or sexual attraction, evolutionary psych seems to have nailed that perfectly. Here they seem to have had some insights, but but missed a few swath of stuff and and actually given the wrong answer to, to, to other subsets. Um, uh, so again, relative claim, and, and I know that there is good evolutionary psych work in these domains, and, and happy if you want to point me to um, to more that, that, that I'm not aware of. Um, but um, I, I guess my, my main point on aesthetics is that um, a lot of aesthetics does seem to be uh, uh, about things like what, um, what what Steven Pinker talks about and what you talked about uh, 15 or so minutes ago, which is just that um, some things are innately pl pleasing, like uh, um, uh, voluptuous uh, woman or, 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 you know, serene landscapes. Probably there's an involved psychology that just makes us attracted to those things or, or, or feel pleasure when looking at such things. Um, and, and I think, you know, Steve Pinker, you know, explains this quite well as like visual cheesecake, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, cheesecake is something that we evolved to like sweet things and, and, and manufacturers have figured out ways to like, you know, pump in as much sweetness and fat as you can into cheesecake. The same, the same with, with some of these, um, uh, some of these uh, uh, painters, especially in like the Renaissance and these kind of pairs, found out ways to like make paintings look really, really real and, and very, very pretty. And sometimes even exaggeratedly so. So, so you can make women more curvy than, than, than is actually possible in, in, in real life. Um, and, and that would be even more stimulating in this uh, visual cheesecake sense. Um, and I think there's good work to show that a lot of art, in fact, does this. And so I think that part of art is very well understood by this by this visual cheesecake uh, um, story that, that Pico describes. And then I think there are other insights in, in aesthetics uh, that, that um, evolutionary psychologists talked about. I, I didn't mention it in my thread, um, uh, but, but um, uh, 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 George, is it uh, Miller? Am I getting his name right? Um, uh, um, I, I, uh, uh, I think that's, uh, well, anyhow, there's a prominent evolutionary psychologist uh, um, uh, who wrote The Mating Mind, um, uh, that, that uh, Jeffrey Miller. Oh, Jeffrey Miller, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right. Um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, he was right to point out that, that I left his work off that thread. Um, uh, but, but, but I, I, uh, so, so let, me, let me reiterate his insight, which I think is, is quite pertinent, which is just that a lot of art is about men showing off their abilities. Um, you know, our creativity or, or, or our spatial abilities or things like that. Um, and, and I think that's, that's very right too, and that captures an essential feature of, of what art does. And, and I think it's very clear why we would evolve a psychology where, where we would look for males who are especially talented or, or try to show off our, our such talents. And I think that that's, that's an important part of what goes on in aesthetics too, and, and he's right to point that out. Um, 
Um, but um, uh, um, I guess my, my main point was, while these are like two essential features, and I, I'm sure there's, there's more to evolutionary psych than that, and, and hopefully you'll bring up some others that I missed out, um, these two prominent uh, insights in evolutionary psych seem to miss some crucial parts of what goes on in aesthetics. Um, that I think you really need to think of contemporary incentives to, 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 to grasp. And which isn't to say they'll be totally independent of what, what Jeffrey talks about or, or totally independent from other insights from evolutionary psych. Obviously, whatever contemporary incentives and cultural evolutionary or other learning processes uh, uh, go on have to go on on top of our evolved minds. So, so, so what they said is right, but it's missing stuff. That's my claim. So, so what are some of the things that they might be missing in art? Well, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, a, a lot of modern art uh, happens to be uh, uh, involved, I think, and, and, and we, can, we can analyze a, a lot of what's going on, but, but one thing that seems to be going on a lot is you add arbitrary constraints. So like, you know, you have to do things by like cutting them up into pieces and, and putting the pieces in random angles in, in your image. Okay, so why random angles and cutting it up into pieces? Um, uh, we can talk about like what that might add, but one of the things that seems to add is it makes it much harder to figure out what's going on. Um, and it makes it much harder to make a compelling image that's like evocative. Um, so, but, but yet, you know, people really like cubism. Um, and, you know, uh, the, I, either, I don't know, you can try to, to paint without a brush. You can paint by just dripping paint. So that seems to be a constraint. The constraint might add some benefits, like like now you get to learn more about like what the person was doing with their arm while they were painting, which is maybe easier to control with a brush. Now you get maybe a deeper sense of what they're feeling, maybe. But it seems to be like an arbitrary constraint, which might highlight some features, but but definitely make other things harder. Like it's harder to, to like draw an image this way, um, and it's harder to express a, a um, uh, to convey an idea as. Uh, um, uh, uh, error-free, error or, or I, you know, I don't know, but, but it seems to do something by adding this constraint. And, and it's not obvious to me, like, why art would have these kind of arbitrary constraints in them, according to um, uh, uh, according to Steve Pinker's story. I think Jeffrey would say, well, maybe adding these constraints allows you to show off creativity in a new way. And, and I think that's right, but th that still, you know, isn't isn't going to tell us. Um, so much about like where these constraints came from, how they got the meanings they did, and things like that. And I, I, again, I think like his story is essentially right, but but you kind of need to look more into like the contemporary incentives to, to, to understand more of what's going on. And I think just thinking about men showing off on, on, on their own, I think is only going to get you the, the starting point. Um, and and I think you need to do more to understand modern art. You need to do more to understand um, uh, some of these other uh, other other um, uh, features. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that Geoffrey Miller really has very good insights into uh, as to why art and artistic behavior might have evolved. But I think that there are two issues here. So on the one hand, uh, I think I'm compelled to agree with you when you say that, for example, we couldn't really explain through... Uh, strictly evolutionary psychological principles, how something like cubism might have uh, evolved uh, culturally, let's say. But on the other hand, and since you're talking about incentives, I think that there are other aspects that we can add to it. So, for example, let's say that, for example, uh, cubism was invented or uh, any other uh, type of art, uh, in uh, yes, related to painting in this case, and it got associated with the elites that people from the uh, the social elite would prefer those types of things just to in an initial phase distinguish themselves from from the other people b below them in the social hierarchy. Let's say so. Uh, uh, if we have that, then I think we can really use we can really use evolved principles, and not only from evolutionary psychology, but also from other disciplines like people who study cultural evolution, but uh, always with our innate. Uh, evolved biases, heuristics, and stuff like that. And I've already talked with Robert Boyd and Peter Richardson on the show. Uh, so, for, for example, if you had uh, an elite that really liked that type of art, then 
uh, you would have perhaps the prestige bias operating there and people would start to looking more and more at those types of things because they started to be associated with uh, social status and then um, perhaps if over time it trickled down uh, the the social hierarchy then it, it would spread among people as a preference as an aesthetic preference and uh, perhaps people would also then activate uh, the 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 conformity bias and and other things like that and what i mean by this is that through several different uh, innate cognitive aspects that we have that uh, are innate and evolved and so we can explain them through evolutionary theory applied to human psychology then with that we would be able to explain why something that really breaks drastically with our innate evolved preferences in terms of beauty and aesthetics would, would then spread through a population and, and people, I, I mean, people perhaps wouldn't like it because of its intrinsic properties, but due to something that was extrinsic to the piece of art, but could be explained as well by evolutionary psychology and other, uh, and other disciplines like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um... I, I, I think I see what you're saying, um, and I, I think like what I would only say is that there seem to be um, features that you need in addition to the evolutionary psych story to understand what's going on, and without those features, you're likely to uh, to misunderstand what's going on. But uh, I guess I, I should mention that, that that in this conversation, it, it, it's clear to me that, that I should think a little bit more carefully uh, about the relation to Jeffrey Miller's story. Um, uh, uh, but you know, let, let me try. Let me try to mention a few uh, a few distinctions uh, or, or a few things that. Um, okay. So 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 one that that, that comes to mind is, and, and maybe he does have a good argument uh, uh, against this. Um, is that um, it's not so obvious why we find the piece itself beautiful if um, if. If it has signs that the um, some of those some of the things that make the piece beautiful are going to be that the artist is is more talented, um, uh, so, so maybe we like it more because it shows more creativity. But some of the things also seem to not relate to that. Um, and uh, again, I, I think he's capturing a, a crucial insight here, but I think there's some parts not captured by it. So let me see if I can articulate a few uh, that are not. So, so one might be um, that um, if the piece conveys a political ideal that we want to show off, then I might say I really like this piece. Um, and, and that could be true whether or not it shows something about the artist who created it. Okay. Another thing that might show off, that might increase our liking of the piece that has nothing to do with the talent of the artist, is if it particularly is good at allowing us to show off our own creativity at deciphering the piece. So, so one thing about Picasso is that if you, if you look at it, it's kind of hard to figure out what's going on, but I don't know, if you took an art history class, you might be able to figure out that that's his dealer holding a flask. And if you could tell that to the person you're next to, well, that can show off something about your own knowledge of art history. Um, and that might be one reason why people like Picasso, is because it allows me to show off my insider knowledge or ability to like solve this puzzle. And, and so I think that that's, the, uh, again, not, not to denigrate Jeffrey's story, because I think that that's, uh, that solves many of the puzzles of art. I, I just think that there are some other puzzles of art that require looking uh, at, at some other aspects of the incentive structure. And my guess is he wouldn't disagree with that, 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 that he'd say he's, he's playing some, but not all. And, and so I, I think that there's probably a richness of many, many incentives at play, one of which is showing off the talent of the artist, another is showing off your own values or your own ability to, your own insider knowledge and ability to like decipher what's going on in the piece. Um, and, and those are three of, I don't know, probably 20 incentives at play. Some of these incentives are going to be ones that are evolutionarily ancient, like men wanting to show off. But, but some might not be like, like um, you know, um, how do you, show off in this particular novel way that hasn't been dealt with in the past, like knowledge of art history. 
um, uh, uh, um, and, 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 and it's probably going to be you know a mixture of these things. Some of which, well, anyhow, I, I hopefully that that um, makes clear um, my point. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, but about the two main points that you referred there, you referred to, for example, you gave the example of perhaps the piece of art transmitting something at the political level and perhaps people would like it because it would be associated with a certain political stance or political message and on the other hand perhaps people liking some pieces of art just because if they are to like them and to tell other people that they like them and to be able to talk about those pieces of art they would be signaling uh, some of their uh, qualities some of their psychological qualities like for example intelligence right so uh, okay so uh, about the political part uh, i mean in evolutionary psychology people also talk about in group out to group dynamics and so uh, and how people are groupish and people like John Tooby uh, uh, have a lot of literature on coalitional psychology so I guess that even uh, on that side of things evolutionary psychology would have something to say and about the second part I guess that we could reduce that I guess to Uh, conspicuous consumption and conspicuous conspicuous signaling because I mean basically that's what you're doing you're saying or you're transmitting to other people the information that you're and you appreciate that type of art and if people tend to associate that taste with, with something that has status in society or with you being a, an intelligent person or something like that. It's the same when we, when we buy any other type of product. For example, if we buy a luxury car, we're doing that probably not only because the car is beautiful or that is because it has good intrinsic properties, but also because through buying it and through showing it outside to other people we're signaling also that we have the resources and the monetary means to do so so yeah. would you agree with that yeah I, I, I think well just to clarify I, I think signaling uh, you, you're right that like um, conspicuous consumption is a large part of it I, but I, I think sometimes the this, this signaling is is um, of other things like like uh, your knowledge of, of art history or, or creativity or, or uh, your political values and group uh, you mentioned some others um, uh, but, but so I do think you know signaling could be much more vast than just signaling wealth um, and, and uh, signaling then once it's that fast you, you could think of whether or not it's it's pre-adapted or whether or not it's it's a new form of signaling a new a, a new trait that, that hasn't shown up in our evolutionary past, I, and I guess I need to think a little bit more carefully on which aspects of art could be explained by pre pre adapted signals, uh, and which aspects kind of require thinking about new things that you want to signal that we've never had to deal with signaling in the past. Uh, obviously, either way, there's going to have to be some kind of evolved psychology of trying to signal or of showing off or things like that, presumably. So, so in that sense, I, I think Jeffrey Miller is fully right. I think it's just a question of how, you know, fine-tuned and pre-adapted the particular things being signaled are and, and, and the particular things that we therefore find, find beautiful. Um, and, and I think in many cases, it's, it's not going to be obvious and it might be an open question. Um, uh, you know, is, is do we find more rare pieces of art, uh, you know, originals instead of replicas? beautiful because of an evolved psychology of conspicuous consumption or an evolved psychology of rarity or is that something that we learn as a, as a novel uh, um, uh, contemporary adaptation and I think that's a case where it's kind of hard to tell and it could be either um, but, but uh, other cases might be harder to do uh, to, to argue our pre-adaptations um, uh, uh, even when, uh, when you allow for this kind of richer signaling space. So, so let me let me let me try with an example or two. But but I, I should admit that this is fair. And like in some of these questions, it might be that that a lot of it is just pre-programmed. Um, but I don't know. So so I like uh, I like antique furniture. 
And um, uh, I think I might have mentioned this in the thread too, but but I, I like this kind of wood, wooden furniture that has like little small squiggly lines in it that are created by worms over hundreds of years. Um, and, and I highly doubt that it's cheesecake because it really just looks like the furniture is cracked. Um, I also kind of doubt, but maybe maybe you can convince me otherwise that this is kind of that this is a, a, a that a, a, my psychology of conspicuous consumption just got turned on. Um, as like a, 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 there's a pre-adaptation to conspicuously consuming, like a, a flip just got switched. Because my sense is, and again, I'm not 100% confident about this. The reason why I like this furniture is because I I, I, I once had a, a, a fairly wealthy, classy friend who bought me furniture like this and, and, and told me this stuff is beautiful, this stuff isn't. And everybody else thought that everything she did was like you know uh, elegant and classy and and. and, and she knew what she was talking about, and I slowly just kind of like acquired that taste. Um, and she happened to really like antique furniture, um, and so I kind of like developed that taste. And, and, and you know, I don't think that at any moment I was like, okay, this furniture will help me show off. I don't even think that like I ever processed that as like conspicuous consumption. I think I just processed it as what is beautiful. I don't know. This girl seems to know. I'm going to copy her. Um, and, and and so I think. That there's kind of a more general psychology of, uh, of social limitation going on here that's not a specific pre-adaptation that has to do with like uh, signaling of, uh, of talent or of wealth or things like that. And so, uh, again, I'm not 100% sure, but, but my sense is that this is, this is coming from a general social learning process and not from a conspicuous consumption uh, module or a men showing off uh, um, uh, uh, creativity module, um, I, I, I think. Um, and so my sense is, uh, is that that's likely going on also with a lot of modern art that, you, you know, you like pieces that you can explain well, that every time you explain well, people tell you, oh, that's really, really beautiful or a good explanation, or your art teacher says are great. And I think that that's kind of a general module that goes on, which, of course, in the long run, I pick up on things like conspicuous consumption or signaling of talent or, or, or creativity or things. But I, I think that the general psychology that's going on is more general than that and will therefore allow you to kind of signal things that are more nuanced than, than create adaptation. So, like these squiggly lines are not something that the worms create are not something that we would have had in our evolutionary past because it kind of requires you know wooden furniture that stays around for hundreds of years, which I think is, is probably a fairly new thing. Um, and so we've kind of only culturally evolved to appreciate this kind of furniture. Um, and, uh, so, so, so that's my sense. My taste for antique furniture is something that couldn't have been a pre-adaptation, and I don't think it's just. Uh, you know, a spillover from a, a, an evolved psychology of conspicuous consumption. I, I think it's got to come from, you need a generalized learning module uh, to get to this type of um, conspicuous consumption that requires this this particular feature that, that's m modern, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but perhaps th that's just because uh, I, I don't know if the discipline of evolutionary psychology in general is still lacking some cognitive mechanisms that aren't still discovered or, or perhaps uh, as people usually talk about there uh, they use the term uh, modules of the mind so perhaps there are some of them we haven't yet discovered but, but for example uh, you you talk a lot about social norms so uh, through game theory we can explain perhaps how certain social norms spread uh, throughout a human population, let's say. But, I, I mean, uh, isn't it the case that we could be attuned, attuned to, uh, to look out for those sorts of cues from the environment, let's say in this case social cues, or not? And, I mean, the way to explain why we are attuned to those sorts of things, like, for example, as I said, the prestige bias, the conformity bias, uh, and other stuff like that. It, it, those things need evolutionary theory to explain why we have minds that uh, look out for those sorts of information in our social environment, and not others, or even why we even care about those things, or, or not. Yeah, so so hundred percent, like this view of like these these learning processes 
conformity, prestige bias, reinforcement learning. Um, uh, um, they, they obviously, if, if they're true, to the extent they're true, they had to have evolved. Um, uh, uh, and, and Joe Henrik and, and Rob Ward in this crowd put a lot of effort into showing these are evolved learning processes that made evolutionary sense. And, and I think they're, they're absolutely right about that. Um, but I still think that's different from calling this evolutionary psychology. And the reason it's different is because the results of these evolved learning processes are, are, are new emergent phenomena. Uh, new types of adaptations that work differently than uh, um, a, 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 a more specialized module uh, that doesn't allow for kind of a, this, uh, a generalized uh, uh, ability to learn. In that they could allow for adaptations in a novel context based on contemporary uh, um, information uh, that wasn't uh, around in our evolutionary past. And so that's the sense in which it's, it's different, um, uh, this, these emergent phenomena and, and the contemporary adaptations, and, and, and the sense in which it could be misleading to just think, to ignore these, these, the, the, the emergent properties of the, these learning processes and just focus on the evolved, uh, um, uh, more specialized modules, is you might, for instance, be hyper-focused on aspects of art that signal um, things that showed up in our evolutionary past, like uh, talent of the artist, um, or, uh, or, or like conspicuous consumption. And, and you might be less prone to take into account the particular incentives that are very new, that weren't around in our past, like uh, um, uh, to show off that, um, say for, for example, uh, another example I mentioned in the thread is, is a lot of our aesthetics seem to be about like showing off that we're, we no longer have to work in the fields and, and we, we, we no longer like, like uh, um, uh, 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 that we, we have more access to like artisanal goods or, 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 or uh, um, so, okay, so I, I kind of mixed two examples there. Let, let, me, let me give you two examples that make this clear. So, so one is like um, in an agricultural society where like some people are wealthy enough to like get out of the fields and to be able to like work indoors, like that's, they might have ways to signal that they don't work in the field, like having long fingernails or, 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 or lighter skin. Those are, those are things that I think wouldn't have shown up in our evolutionary past. So that's a sense of our aesthetics that like doesn't just come out of a, a strict view of like a, a pre-adaptation. You kind of have to think of an emergent property of, of, of a novel type of incentive to show that you don't work in the field. That's the new incentive. And so that's something that I think you would miss if you just think about evolutionary psychology. Okay. Likewise, post-industrial revolution, we had these artisanal goods, like ways of showing that like you have jewelry that was handmade or, or that you have chocolate or wine that was like made by yourself or your friends if you're a hipster. And these are things that like you would want to signal in our society. So, so in, my, in, in a contemporary environment where like you have to deal with like showing that things aren't mass produced. Showing something's not mass produced is not something we had to do in the past. It's not something we evolved like a capability of doing. We had to kind of like figure out that's something important to do. And th that I think you can only do with, with a, not with a specialized module, uh, uh, um, but with more uh, a generalized like social learning module, like the, the kind of board and, and, and Henry talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but uh, let me just tell you this, because I, I mean, I, I think you are too focused on the idea that perhaps evolutionary psychologists try to explain all of human behavior on the basis of adaptations. That is, that you think that perhaps the, uh, it is adaptations all the way down in evolutionary psychology, but there are uh, certain things and even major ones, like for example, religion, that is explained through evolutionary theory, not as an adaptation, even though in all studied societies, uh, people have some sort of religion or another, uh, they, they don't uh, say that it's an adaptation, but that it is rather a byproduct of several different adaptations. So, for example, through the work of Pascal Boyer, Scott Atron, Robert Macaulay and others uh, in the Cognitive Science of Religion, they talk about our religion is the product of several different adaptations, like, for example, a, th a theory of mind, or as it was previous previously known, uh, folk psychology, and also folk physics, that is, 
how we are innately predisposed to interact with the world around us and to deal with solid objects and things like that and the properties of our world, let's say. Also, uh, folk biology, that, that is the ways we think about other uh, animated entities, other living biological entities. And then also uh, things like, for example, the hyperactive agency detection device that is if we see something happening in the world we tend to attribute uh, an, an agent to it we tend to think that someone or something caused that thing to happen and also promiscuous teleology that say uh, that is to say that we tend to think that things follow a certain path, a certain unidirectional path when developing and evolving and things like that. So, and 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 also also other adaptations and other modules they talk about. But this was just to give you a few examples. But I mean, they they gather all of these different adaptations and they. They studied religion on that basis as different aspects of religion being the byproduct of those mental adaptations that we've evolved to deal with other uh, revolutionarily relevant, ev evolutionarily sorry, relevant problems. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's another good example, uh, um, and I think this might help illustrate some of the other points that maybe were harder to illustrate with, with aesthetics. So I'm glad you brought it up, even though it wasn't wasn't in that that original thread. Uh, uh, so so for starters, I guess I should should say I, I think there is a lot of insight in, in this um, uh, 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 um, psychological or cultural literature story to to religion. Uh, uh, there, there's clearly a lot of aspects of religion. That are, are byproducts of our uh, evolved psychology, like agency detection, um, uh, and I think that, that that's you know insightful and valuable work that 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 uh, picks out and documents these effects. However, uh, I, I think that um, uh, this also this work also exemplifies one of my earlier points that I was making, which is that evolutionary psychologists have a tendency to see things as either functional, uh, either pre pre adapted, evolved. Uh, um, uh, something that was functional in our EEA and, and by chance still is, or something that's a byproduct. And, and missing out that you can get a lot of functional stuff uh, do, uh, that, are, that are only functional with respect to our current contemporary uh, um, incentive structure. And I think a lot of religion fits the latter, and there's a lot of stuff that, that Boye and, and, and colleagues missed as a result of that. Okay, which again isn't to say that that uh, they weren't picking up on, on, on real insights with, with the, the examples that you gave. I just think that those examples miss out on a lot of the meat. Um, so, so what do I mean by a lot of the meat? I think, and, and maybe you can prove me wrong on this or, or send me some references otherwise, but I think a lot of the stuff that they're picking up on are cases in which we're looking at the content of religious beliefs that's, that's what I would call uh, not payoff. Uh, relevant. So, um, you know, whether I believe that God has, um, you know, uh, looks kind of like a, a, a human agent or doesn't in my, in, my, in my image of God is not a particularly payoff relevant feature of religion. It's an interesting feature of our psychology that I imagine him as an old white dude with, with a big beard. Um, it's, it's interesting that that's how I imagine God, but, but I don't think that that's like the most um, uh, I, I guess, uh, historically or practically important feature of religion that's like begging for an explanation. And, and uh, 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 um, those features are, are the features that I think of as payoff relevant. Things like, why does religion cause you to be more likely to cooperate with in-group members by, by uh, hate on out-group members? Why does religion cause you to, to like follow a bunch of like useless, silly rules? Um, and uh, maybe why do theological disputes have the certain features that they have or people are willing to die for them or things like that? And, and so, so I think of those as like um, uh, more payoff relevant and hence, you know, maybe more, well, that's what I'm, what I find more interesting is like, you know, why we fought wars over religion, um, why religion causes us to like be nice to fellow religious people and hate on others. And the exact features of how I imagine God is like, 
maybe will teach us something interesting about like cognition, but isn't a fundamental open question about religion. And I think that the 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 um, branch of research that that uh, Boya et al are good at is those features that God is likely to have, but but it says less about these kind of more I think materially relevant uh, um, uh, payoff relevant features of religion, which I find both more puzzling as well as. Um, uh, their approach uh, has, has less to say about. And I think to answer those things, you need to think about uh, other things like cultural evolution process and, and contemporary incentives. And because Boyer are, are, are focused on pre-adaptations and uh, byproducts, they kind of miss all that junk. Um, and again, I think what they're saying is right. It's just missing a lot of this really, really important stuff. And, and, and the payoff relevant stuff is what I tend to, to, to focus on in, in my own research. So I might ask questions like, well, like the ones I listed to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. But now, and since you talked about payoffs and costs, uh, uh, let me just give you another example. This, uh, this has nothing to do with aesthetics nor religion or anything like that. But since we're also we're talking about social norms and in your thread, you also refer to morality. Um, recently, I've had on the show Dr. Alexander Rosenberg, and he, he has written a very interesting book, How History Gets Things Wrong, and there he gives a very interesting example uh, about how foot binding uh, developed in uh, ancient China and then spread as a social norm throughout the entire population. It started on the elites and then it trickled down through the rest of the population and then eventually uh, they, they simply stopped doing that. They, they stop that practice, that tradition, let's say. Be, be, and he starts off by this. So we have, um, from an evolutionary perspective, men have paternity uncertainty. That is, they, they can't be 100% sure that the child that was born uh, from the woman they are with is uh, is is right uh, they, they can't be sure of that only the the women can be sure so uh, he, he, to he, he starts off with that and then he says that in the specific circumstances of China I don't know perhaps because they have access to certain types of materials or they uh, or because the way in their specific uh, environment they evolved certain types of uh, technologies or things like that they decided to start uh, foot binding the women because that, that would render it much more difficult for them to uh, to betray their husbands and to, uh, that is to, for them to prevent infidelity on the part of the women. And then uh, s since it started as something associated with the elite and with status, eventually uh, no one would be able to marry one of their daughters if she was not uh, foot-binded or something like that. So and so the, this practice spread throughout Chinese society, but eventually, because it reached the point of saturation where everyone was doing it, and that would no longer distinguish some women from other women, let's say, eventually, I think it was in, in the 20th century, uh, someone with a lot of status even uh, decided to not foot bind uh, their daughters a and and since no one was really able already to distinguish themselves from other people because virtually all women were foot binded then e e eventually they they discontinued that type of practice. So, I mean, but, but I'm picking up on this example not only because he, in part he explains it through evolutionary game theory, but he starts off from uh, evolutionary theory with the part of men having paternity uncertainty and that would be at the basis of that type of behavior. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I haven't seen this paper. Um, but I, I guess I would say, like, uh, yes, and any time you're going to um, model kind of cultural evolutionary processes or learning processes, and, and, and including when, when you incorporate game theory, it's going to be based on uh, either uh, uh, a notion of incentives that, uh, uh, that, that is biologically ingrained, um, or, or something that is biasing the, the learning processes that's biologically ingrained. Uh, and and that's, that's definitely going to incorporate information from our evolutionary past, as well as uh, uh, um, more or less, and depending on the context, and, 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 and it, it may be more in some cases than other cases, more or less uh, 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 specialized you know, uh, uh, modules. Um, and so, so I, I agree that, that in this case, the like, it sounds like the game theory model really needed to take into account certain features of our biological past, like like the differences between ma males and females when it comes to, to uh, paternity uh, uh, and maternity certainty. Um, and, and, and I think that's generally true, that any model that I write down, you're going to kind of have to make certain assumptions of our preferences based on what makes evolutionary sense. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, any notion of incentives or any notion of a learning process will have to have to take into account some basic evolutionary facts. I, I think that's right. And, and it would be a pretty bad model if it wasn't grounded in, in evolutionary reasoning because um, these things clearly evolved. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the, the real question is just can you stop after you've done that biological evolutionary reasoning or do you also need to then do an, uh, like additional research or modeling about the contemporary incentives or cultural evolution or, or, or reinforcement learning process? And my claim would be that in some contexts it's enough to stop after the evolutionary, uh, um, after modeling the biological evolutionary process. But but in other cases you need to do more than that. I would, I would uh, yeah, that's that's the claim. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and what if we were to put it this way? So uh, we would explain the basis or the origins of certain behaviors uh, through evolutionary theory, and then uh, to explain the precise behaviors that people adopt in a certain society, we would have to add uh, the part coming from uh, cultural and social evolutions, uh, evolution and perhaps uh, how people uh, accumulate certain uh, technologies and behaviors over time through cultural evolution and cumulative culture and things like that. And uh, when we have a society that, w that works under certain socio-cultural norms, then we have to go back to our innate psychology to explain how those sorts of cues from the environment are processed by our minds. Yeah, I, I think that might, might suffice for some of the things we've been talking about. Like, like maybe for a lot of the aesthetics examples I, I gave, that's all you need. I, I, I think, and, and maybe it's worth us talking through, that will do less well when we talk about religion or, or politics or morality. In those cases, I think it's not just that you're filling in some of the details with, with, with knowledge of the, the particular culture. I think you're getting totally new phenomena out of, out of the, uh, the uh, cultural pro uh, learning processes. Um, so, you know, the idea of like in-group cooperation and out-group hate. Um, and, and what counts as an in-group member, and uh, um, what, therefore what uh, theology ends up developing to support that. I think it's, it's a lot more than just the details of the cultural environment that you're filling in. I think that that's a totally emergent phenomenon that, that you don't get unless you have cultural evolution. Um, and I think likewise with, with like politics, if you want to understand like political ideologies, you, you really can't just think about an involved psychology of like, coalition formation and then, and then uh, side taking. I think uh, you, you really need to take into account the, um, the, the, uh, um, to, to get any sense of the types of political principles people espouse, the way they, uh, uh, I think that really requires um, uh, uh, emergent properties of the political institutions that, that we have. Um, uh, yeah, so may maybe it's worth, I don't know if we have time today, but maybe it's worth unpacking some of those cases where, unlike aesthetics, I think you're getting more emerging properties of the cultural uh, um, e evolution than just filling in some of the contextual details. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, but, but I, I mean, I think that in this case, what I don't understand is perhaps what you mean by emergent properties, because, I mean, they have to be biologically based because we can't we wouldn't be able to process information that our brains are not able to deal with so yeah. what could you please clar clarify a bit more what you mean by emergent properties there yeah um so so let, let me try um so one of the things that i mean is um, so, uh, uh, the difference between uh, uh, what's an equilibria with respect to our current incentive structure and an equilibria with respect to, uh, you know, what would have been an equilibria in the EEA, uh, in our evolutionary past. That difference, I, I, I think, is, is kind of fundamental, and the things that are equilibria only in our contemporary environment you can't get to those things, those equilibria, unless you have a process that uh, does real-time adjustments within, you know, a current uh, contemporary environment. And so that, the idea that you get to contemporary functionality, the idea that you can get to functional behavior in the contemporary environment, I think you can only get if you have a generalized, uh, if you have a process that dynamically updates and achieves functionality in real time. And uh, uh, that's faster than biological evolution, something like cultural evolution or reinforcement learning. And so the result that we behave functionally in our contemporary environment, if that contemporary environment is not the same as anything we've experienced in our evolutionary past, then that result, that we're a functional for our current environment, is an emergent phenomenon of these these uh, dynamic adjustment processes, like cultural evolution or reinforcement learning. That would be one example of an emergent phenomenon. And by emergent phenomena, I mean it doesn't just, um, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I don't have a good definition of an emergent phenomena. I, I, I think all I mean by it is it's something that comes out of these adjustment processes that like you don't really need to think so much about what caused these adjustment processes to get off the ground. These processes do a lot of work on their own, and if you don't think about these processes, you kind of miss that insight, and and it would be kind of hard to model that insight on its own. Maybe it's yeah. I guess I don't have a good definition of emergent property, but but it seems like that's one emergent property is that contemporary functionality. That uh, um, thinking about specialized modules wouldn't give you that, uh, you, and you don't really need to think so much about. Just like you, in order to understand biological evolution, you don't need to think so much about physics or, or the biochemistry. Same thing here. To understand that you, that you can get contemporary functionality, you don't really need to think about what got cultural evolution off the ground. You just kind of need to treat, need to realize one property of cultural evolution is is it finds contemporary functionality. Um, uh, maybe that's all I mean by, by emergent phenomena. And, and there's only one example of an emergent phenomena, I, I, the one that I focus on in my work, because I, I focus on incentives and, and game theory. But I, I think Joe Henrik and Rob Board will, will talk about several others, uh, like the importance of cultural group selection, which, which, which very much require uh, cultural evolution to get off the ground and, 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 and have a similar feature that you don't really get them straight out of unevolved psychology. You kind of need this this new dynamic process to get that off the ground. And, and, and to get that off the ground, you don't really need to think about what led to the dynamic process so much. You, you, you kind of just need to think about cultural evolution as a new thing. Um, and, and so that, that's kind of what I mean by it. And I think the analogy to like, do you need to know biochemistry to understand biological evolution? Or do you need to know physics to understand biological evolution? No, not really. Most of biological evolution uh, you can ignore that stuff before. And it's not enough to think about just physics to understand evolution. Like, because a lot of what evolution does is kind of an emergent phenomena of natural selection. And so I think the same thing here, there are emergent phenomena, there are properties of human psychology that come out of cultural evolution or that come out of reinforcement learning that don't really require you thinking about biological evolution and, and, uh, and that um, you'll miss if you don't think about this, this phenomenon. Um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me ju just before we go, let me just give you another example. Uh, one I talked about with uh, David Buss and Sarah Hill. Uh, Sarah Hill does a lot of uh, uh, work in life history theory, which is very interesting. But anyway, uh, at a certain point in their interviews, I asked them if perhaps, for example, if uh, since nowadays uh, we have uh, the internet and online pornography, if men are exposed to that, uh, perhaps uh, that environmental cue would, would tweak their mating systems to prefer short-term strategies because, uh, I, I mean, subconsciously, uh, uh, their, cogni their cognitive mechanisms associated with mating would process that information as if uh, there were a lot of beautiful and available women all the time to mate with them. Uh, and, I, and I asked them if that perhaps would be a novel strategy that wasn't really available for us in, in our uh, environment of evolutionary adaptedness because we really didn't have uh, as many women available to mate and, and, and women signaling to us that they would be uh, available to mate with us during our during most of our evolutionary history. Uh, and I mean, uh, I, I, guess, I guess that that would be what you mean by an, by an emergent property in this case that perhaps men would prefer more uh, a short term mating strategy than than they would during most of our history because we didn't have we didn't got that environmental cue uh, but 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 in this case they say that it is not exactly a novel strategy but it is something that our uh, innate cognition uh, would produce yeah. e e if and when we were exposed to that kind of information even though we weren't really exposed to it throughout most of our histories. So. Yeah, I, I think that, that, that's right that if your prediction turns out to be true, I'm not I'm not sure if it's true, but but if it turns out to be true that that um, uh, we're more into short-term mates after being exposed to, to internet pornography, um, that, then I think an easy explanation for that would be uh, a life history story explanation, which is just that if you see a lot of willing women, then you should realize that they're readily available, and so you should uh, adjust your strategy. And and I would call that again using my language from earlier pre pre adaptation. In that we, we just have a, uh, a a switch that and that switch itself evolved, which is like long term versus short term mating strategy. Well, it depends how how readily available women are, and that switch gets turned on by, by the easy access to pornography. Um, and and, and I, I don't think that that requires any notion of cultural evolution or or, or any emergent property of of, of of our learning processes to comprehend. And, and I think that's a good contrasting case because that, that's a case where there is some notion of learning or some notion of cultural input, but I think it's very, very different from the cases I'm describing. And I, I think it's the case that that um, evolutionary psychologists tend to turn to and they often use it to say, you know, to give lip service to their, their tending to, to culture um, or to environmental inputs. I, I just think that that's, that's kind of one side in which culture has an input, namely it adjusts switches on evolved uh, um, uh, modules. But I think that that's, that's actually, uh, you know, that does well in some contexts like, like mating psychology, but is missing out on a lot of other stuff. And so I really want to contrast that with when I was talking about, you know, um, religion and morality and politics. I think those are really hard to explain using the same kind of story where there's just a switch that gets flipped on. Um, and so, so when I refer to, to cultural evolution and emergent properties, I very much mean not those cases. Those are cases that I think evolutionary psychology uh, de deals with fine, but, but I think that they're different. And I think it's kind of, kind of unfair on a sleight of hand for, for evolutionary psychologists to, to, to mention those cases and, and claim that they're, they're therefore recognizing cultural evolution. Because um, I, I think that's just kind of like a tiny fraction of what culture is doing and not the, um, yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Hoffman, we've already covered a lot of ground today. What would you say about us finishing the interview at this point and perhaps another time in the future having another conversation, perhaps also to talk about, as, as I told you before the interview started, about your threads on uh, methodology in psychology and perhaps some methodological flaws that people have in psychology and also about your great thread on moral realism. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. Yeah, okay. uh, you're good questions and, and thanks for having me. Okay. Oh, by, by the way, by the way, just before we go, uh, would you like to tell people what are some of the best places on the internet for them to get in touch with your work? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I'm fairly active on Twitter. Um, and then if the, you Google my name, you'll, you'll find my website with... Um, uh, you know, some, some recent working papers and, and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So again, thank you a lot for taking the time. It was really a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for your, your questions. They were very engaging. Um, yeah. Hi everybody. Thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. Uh, I've started this channel in February 2018 and so I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields and I would really like to ask you just to consider visiting my Patreon page and making a pledge there. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Uh, and so otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Per Elga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Jelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda and Brian Rivera. Thank you for all.